Welcome to Steamworks. I'm Tim. This is Tim's Top Tool Tips. Here's a typical machining conundrum. We have a machined face and the bore, which is true to it. We need to machine the other face, making sure that it is concentric, parallel and square to all the other faces. So how do we mount that? The thing we need is called a mandrel, and this is quite easily made in the workshop. It has key requirements. It needs to hold the part that allows me to machine the other faces concentric to those already machined. The mandrel needs to be strong enough to hold the part whilst machining, but not cause any damage. I need access to the area to be machined away. There are two parts to be machined, so I'd like to interchange them without changing the existing setup. This is a lump of inch and quarter mild steel, EN1A. The mandrel we need is in here somewhere. The position of a couple of the key features are marked off using the sharpie. Keeping pen and digits away from the moving parts as much as possible. Facing the end is the normal procedure. It's amazing how poor the finish looks on video when it's glass smooth to the touch. This end will be gripped in a collet or a chuck and for that reason I'm turning it down to a standard size, in this case 3 quarters of an inch diameter. I do use cutting oil but it affects the video and fogs up the camera. You can just see the bit of smoke coming off it now. As usual, I'll skim the end face and undercut just a little. I'm skimming the outside to make sure this part is parallel with the shank just turned. This is going to help set the mandrel to run true in later operations. As always, we need to remove the sharp edges. I'm fortunate enough to own a grip tube chuck. Loosening these bolts allows the body of the chuck to float on its back plate. Using a DTI, the chuck can be adjusted to make the part run absolutely true. The bolts I'm adjusting are wedges and force the chuck over one way or the other. The chuck is adjusted to half the readout, then the readout zeroed and moved round to the next index, and the process repeated until the part will run absolutely true. The other side's faced off to match the first. This section is the working part of the mandrel, which will expand inside the bore. So this is turned to a, a reasonably good fit to the part to be machined. I'm using a parted tool 
to create a good undercut. The reason for this will become clear shortly. Not the best use for a parting tool, but it does the job. The finish is pretty good, but I polish it up with some 1200 grit wet and dry to make sure it can't mark the bow. Cask gunmetal is very soft and will pick up any marks from any high spots present on this manual. As you can see, the length is such that I can still get to the area need to be machined on this cylinder. A good sliding fit. Now the centre needs to be hollowed out so we can make it expand. It's first drilled to take a M8 tap. It's then opened out to the minor diameter of the cone that we're going to machine shortly. The top slide is moved over to 10 degrees. This is a taper that I find works quite well in these situations. The boring bar is then used to open out the taper using the top slide only for the longitudinal cuts and indexing the cross moving the cross slide out. A really good finish can be attained if you take a bit of time. Turning a tape like this can create a really sharp edge. This is removed with a fine file. Internal taper done. This bit of rusty steel is now going to become the opposite taper, which will enable us to expand the mandrel. The length is roughly marked and the piece is faced. An undercut is made with a parting tool. This makes it easy with the first part machine in the taper. The plug is then drilled and tapped M8. Because the top slide has not been moved, both these tapers should match perfectly. I don't want this to get stuck in the bore, so again, a little bit of a polish with some 1200 grit. This plug is then parted to length.
four slots are needed. This square collet holder makes that job a lot easier. The four slots are going to run into holes, which helps with machining, but also allows them to spring a little. I use the vice jaws to find the centre of the mandrel, then drill the holes one at a time. These holes are clear of the end of the taper. The end in the relieved area drilled earlier at the minor diameter of the cone. Accurately setting up a slitting saw can be a bit tricky. This is my method. The saw is carefully lowered down until it's just touching the part. The DTI or axis collar is then zeroed. Then the saw is lowered further to one half of its thickness. In this case, it's three thirty seconds thick, so down to 46 down. With the DRO zeroed, the middle of the saw is now to the top of the part. To cut down the middle of the part, we simply lower further to half the diameter of the part. Now the saw should be aligned to the centre. After a little cutting oil, the saw is positioned so that it's not too steep a cutting angle to the part. Here you can see I'm moving the part away from the saw. A shallower angle stops the saw from trying to dig in. The idea is to cut the piece out, not chop the piece out. We can then steadily cut towards the relief hole at the end. Using the square collet chuck, it's easy to index the part round for the next saw cut. Once complete, we need to make sure that all the burrs are removed so we don't mark the bore when it's gripped. Well, look at that, it actually fits well. Wow. I've lock tightened a bolt into the mating cone and this now screws into the body. Tightening this into the mating taper causes the mandrel to expand, gripping the cylinder by the bore. So there you have it, one expanding mandrel. But does it work? It's aligned in the chuck using the DTI on the machine shoulder. The cylinder is then slid on and the taper tightened to expand the mandrel.
nice and secure for machining this interrupted cut. Job done.